This is the face of crisis. In this issue, the big picture shows you the role of the United States Army in Berlin from VE Day 1945 to the critical summer of 1961. present The Big Picture, an official report produced for the armed forces and the American people. Mid-August 1961, across a few yards of Berlin Street, world peace hangs in the balance. Tensions long fermenting in the divided city reach a peak as East German communists in violation of international agreements, seal off the border to the western sector of the city. It is a time of incident, of anxiety, of explosive emotions on both sides. United States troops in Berlin, isolated geographically 110 miles within the Soviet zone of Germany, face a grim task. The American soldier here has learned to live with tension. But despite renewed coercion and threat, his mission remains fixed. To maintain our rights in West Berlin and to carry out United States policies. have brought these men to this hazardous appointment with history. May 8, 1945, VE Day. The United States, the Soviet Union, and other allied nations, partners in the great victory over Nazi Germany, celebrate their triumph. No hint of discord here. The war in Europe is over. The division of Germany is agreed upon. Troops of the United States, Britain, and France are to occupy the western portion of the country. The Soviet Union, the eastern portion. Berlin, encircled by the Soviet zone, becomes a divided city. The Third Reich has fallen leaving its scars on the land and the people. Soon, Soviet policies toward Eastern Germany take shape. Suppression of freedom, confiscation of industry. Complete communist indoctrination of East German youth. Two are victors, but we do not take the spoils. Instead, U.S. soldiers help a defeated people find the way back. June 16, 1948. The first in a long series of Berlin crises. The Soviets, failing to win support for communism in free elections, walk out on the Kommandatura, the allied governing body for Berlin. June 24, 1948. The Soviets cut off all land and water routes between Berlin and the western zone of Germany. Objective, to force the western allies out of Berlin and starve the people of the city into the communist fold. The plan fails. Over 250,000 flights by American, British and French aircraft 
supply Berlin with its needs for the next 11 months. In this combined effort, the United States Army and Air Force, drawing on their vast experience in supply operations during World War II, marshal their resources, maintaining the lifeline to West Berlin. By spring 1949, the Soviets lift the blockade. But bitterness and mistrust continue. This is the era of the no entry sign, the barrier, the checkpoint. The Cold War is on in earnest. U.S. troops of the Berlin garrison are charged with the security of the American zone. Military police patrol the city and its checkpoints. Ever present beyond the barriers is communist Germany, a grim reality to be lived with daily. Berlin becomes a focal point of the growing dissension between the West and the Soviet Union. In the 1950s, the United States Army in Berlin, as in all of Western Germany, is a steady, constructive influence, restoring dignity to the people and helping to rebuild a free German nation. With American aid, West Germany attains prosperity and a dynamic economy a vivid example of growth that could only have been accomplished under the protection of sympathetic military forces. of our soldiers in local projects, encouraged by both the United States Army and the German people, creates an atmosphere of goodwill and friendship. Youth activities become an important part of the Army's program of participation in the national life of West Germany. Across the border, East Berlin reflects the influence of its Soviet masters. As early as the spring of 1950, the Soviet Union begins arming East German forces under the guise of People's Police. Soon, plans are announced to turn over to the East German puppet regime border and traffic control into the Federal Republic of West Germany. But the United States will not recognize the Soviet-imposed East German communist government. June 17, 1953. Protesting exploitation by the communists, German workers staged demonstrations in East Berlin. Riots spread rapidly to other East German cities. Soviet armed forces are used to subdue the disorders. The 
anti-communist riots result in a mass movement of East Berliners and East Germans to freedom in the West. An exodus that is to continue and grow with the years and become a major issue in the Cold War over Berlin. By 1960, the steady stream of those fleeing to the West has become a torrent. Failure of the East German government to halt the flow of refugees and increasing prosperity in West Berlin disturbed the Soviets. September 1960, at the United Nations General Assembly, Premier Nikita Khrushchev once again threatens to sign a separate peace treaty with the East German regime, annulling Western rights in Berlin and jeopardizing the Allied position in that city. Какая, какая, так сказать, невинность, понимаете, разыгрывается здесь, в то время, когда знает, что эта невинная барышня уже, наверное, десяток имеет детей. Soviet demands, often repeated, include separate peace treaties with the two German states. Berlin to become a free, demilitarized city. NATO powers to withdraw their forces and dismantle all military bases on foreign territory. In return, the Soviets will withdraw their armies from East Germany, a move of only a few hundred miles. The package is neatly wrapped, but the United States and her allies do not buy it. It is not a proposal for peace, but a design for conquest by making West Berlin and the free nations of Europe vulnerable to communist incursion. The timetable of crisis moves swiftly toward a climax. In July 1961, 30,000 East Germans find refuge in the West. In the first 12 days of August, more than 20,000 make the race for freedom. More than ever, West Berlin becomes the passageway to liberty and a stumbling block to communist plans. From President John F. Kennedy, American encouragement and assurance for West Berliners and all free Germans. It would be a mistake for others to look upon Berlin because of its location as a tempting target. The United States is there. The United Kingdom and France are there. The Pledge of NATO is there and the people of Berlin are there. It is as secure in that sense as the rest of us, for we cannot separate its safety from our own. The solemn vow we each of us gave to West Berlin in time of peace will not be broken in time of danger. If we do not meet our commitments to Berlin, where will we later stand? If we are not true to our word there, all that we have achieved in collective security, which relies on these words, will mean nothing. And if there is one path above all others to war, it is the path of weakness and disunity. To sum it all up, we seek peace, but we shall not surrender. That is the central meaning of this crisis and the meaning of this government policy. With your help and the help of other free men, this crisis can be surmounted. Freedom can prevail, and peace can endure. It is a day-to-day -day crisis as Berlin becomes a symbol of the Western stand against communist aggression. August 13, 1961. Threatened with economic chaos in East Berlin and in East Germany, 
If the flow of refugees continues, the East German government, supported by Soviet forces, seals off the sector border between East and West Berlin. To the Iron Curtain is added a curtain of cement as East German communists erect a wall to stop the refugees. The wall outrages free Germany and the Western allies. The Big Four Agreement, signed at the end of World War II, made all Berlin one entity jointly occupied by the Western Three and the Soviet Union. Now, the action of the East German communist government threatens permanent discord to the life of the city, as one after another, entry points between East and West Berlin are sealed off. West Berliners grow restive. Many have lost their jobs as a result of economic disruptions caused by the arbitrary communist action. Relatives and friends are separated. Crowds of West Berliners flock to the border, stage mass demonstrations. United States troops cooperating with the West Berlin police face the tense and difficult task of keeping order, avoiding any incident which might aggravate the situation. General Frederick Hartel, commanding General Berlin Command, keeps a watchful eye on the operations. West Berlin's mayor, Willy Brandt, aware of the intense feelings of his people, attends a mass rally. urges restraint, expresses confidence and support for free Berlin by the United States and the Western Allies. In the next few days, American soldiers patrolling the border area are only yards away from a shooting war. It is a time for patience and self-control. But U.S. troops are ordered to resist any encroachment on the freedom of West Berlin or our rights of entry into East Berlin. At this crucial time, Secretary of the Navy John Connolly pays an official visit to Berlin. He is briefed by officers of the United States Army Berlin Garrison on training activities, intensified now to meet any emergency. August 18, 1961, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson arrives in West Berlin as the personal emissary of President Kennedy. At Tempelhof Airport, the Vice President, accompanied by Major General Albert Watson, United States Commander Berlin, review an honor guard of United States soldiers and West Berlin police. Vice President and Mayor Brandt move on to City Hall, where an anxious people seek reassurance on the position of the United States. For their part, West Germans make it clear that they want the Western Allies to stay and are opposed to any weakening in the protection they now enjoy.
Vice President Johnson carries a message from President Kennedy. The pledge the President has given to the freedom of West Berlin and to Western access rights is firm. The United States government is committed to the survival and the creative future of a free West Berlin. General Lucius Clay, who engineered the 1948 Berlin airlift, is President Kennedy's special advisor to West Berlin in the crisis. August 19, 1961. The first battle group of the United States 7th Army is dispatched across 110 miles of Soviet-occupied East Germany to join our forces in West Berlin. group commanded by Colonel Glover S. Johns is met by General Hartel. The trip along the Autobahn has been without incident. As the convoy enters West Berlin, it is greeted by an enthusiastic populace. Sixteen years before, American troops entered this city as an occupying power. Now the cycle has come full turn as once more United States soldiers move into the city. But this time they come as protectors to help West Berlin authorities keep law and order, to fight if necessary for United States rights and a free Berlin.
communist threat to West Berlin is clear. The issue is joined. Our commitment to that city and its people is firm. Whatever the future, however the explosive Berlin crisis may develop, the United States Army must inevitably continue to play a key role.